those of you that are online right now with us. As you know, I have to do the quick setup for my monitors, so let me double check. And I start a minute early just for that reason, so that we can get this all set up and ready so that when we get to the time to start, we are ready to start. So this will just take a minute. Hallelujah. God is good. And all of you said amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's see. Publish. Posting. Posted. Now let's find out if it's on there. And there I am. Okay. Cool. As Mary gets in position to uh, start the worship. All right, praise the Lord. This is Pastor Bill Emmons, Capital Faith Center, and uh, glad to have you with us this morning. So good morning. We're getting really close to Christmas, and uh, back in June, I warned everybody, it'll be here before you know it. Guess what? <laughs> We're almost there. So today is the 12th, so we've got, what, 13 days left? No Christmas, man, and, and it'll go by faster than you think. I want to encourage you to take time to enjoy the season, and get out and see the lights and get to the uh, church services that offer some kind of a Christmas uh, program, maybe, you know, that give you a blessing. Um, you know, and partake of the, the holiday uh, time, because it'll be gone before you know it. And, uh, you know, enjoy your eggnog drinks and your uh, whatever else you'd like to <laughs> do. And have a big family get together if you got family around you, um, you know, come Christmas Day. But uh, I enjoy this season. For me, it starts back in August. <laughs> uh, let me explain that. Uh, I love football. I used to play football, so uh, it's just kind of a natural part of me. But uh, preseason begins in August, so for me, that marks the beginning of the holidays. And then, uh, of course, we, we get you know, into actual fall, and uh, we've got uh, you know, October... Uh, fall festivals and things like that going on in churches and uh, then we get November we got Thanksgiving we enjoyed that a couple weeks back and uh, then Christmas then New Year's so we have to me this is a very enjoyable time uh, I was just sharing with somebody this morning uh, online uh, made a comment that their wife that this is a husband speaking says my wife thinks that every kind of decoration and things related to Christmas are all pagan, so they can't even, he didn't even have any decorations or anything. And I shared with them that, uh, good morning, Steve. Praise the Lord. Good. I just saw the screen move there. Good to have you with us. Um, anyway, I shared with them about Martin Luther, that Martin Luther is actually the first one that we have record of that implemented what we didn't recognize as the Christmas tree. And the, the story that what is on record is that he was walking through the woods one night uh, at Christmas time and he was praising God for uh, redemption, for Jesus, for this beautiful creation. Looking up through the trees, he saw the lights, the, the, the stars twinkling at, at night and looked like lights uh, on branches of trees. And he thought how beautiful that is. And he decided to cut down a tree and uh, take it back to the house and uh, light the, the limbs with candles. And that was the beginning of the, officially what we call the Christmas tree. That was all to glorify God. That was all to remember. Uh, the candles were lights to remember the blessings of God and our redemption. And uh, all the Christmas decorations spin off from there. The ornaments, uh, we recognize the beauty of God's creation with the ornaments. Um, and, and the tree represents life, you know. So there's a lot of things, a lot of symbolism, Christian symbolism involved with the Christmas decorations. So I would never tell anybody, don't do it because the pagans maybe have something similar. Well, the devil's always trying to copy God thinking he can do it better. and He can't. So we, we stick with what we have, which is worship of the one true God, the one Savior, Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's what this season is about. It's a special time to celebrate. So I want you to join with us. And uh, I have some more information to share with you in a few minutes, but let's take a few minutes and worship the Lord. Uh, we have a song uh, you've heard before, 
but I just felt last night that this was the one we were supposed to use today. So we're going to go ahead and begin our worship and, and worship with us. Don't be an observer, be a, be a participator. Amen.
is such a such an anointed song. I'll tell you. I don't know if you know the story behind it or not, but that little boy that was being held by his father is the boy that the song was written because of. And uh, the, the, the boy was in the hospital. Was Doctors had said, you know, he's going to die. Um, you know, you better come see him now before, before it's gone. Um, so the report got around to their prayer group, and the gentleman leading worship was praying and interceding. And this song grew out of that, and the boy got healed, obviously, and uh, totally, totally delivered, totally healed, totally restored. But that song has such an anointing on it, because that was a song of healing, that was a song of deliverance. And every time I hear that song, it reminds me that God is still alive, God is still on the throne, He still heals today, He still answers prayers. And uh, I'm, I'm also an example of that after the experience that I went through. Oh, I just saw the lights change. <laughs> All of a sudden, they got bright. Um, we, we, anyway, uh, I've shared my testimony many times what happened to me on August 8th. Uh, the devil tried to take my life. I, I uh, did die temporarily. Uh, God raised me back up. I don't know how long I was gone. But I, I did have a brief experience in heaven, and uh, then they, they brought me back, and here I am, uh, what, five months, six months later, uh, well, let's see, August, September, October, November, December, so, uh, oh, four months, I hadn't even been that long. But I'm back, and I feel just as strong as I did before, I, I, uh, my endurance is still increasing, but uh, I really believe that all the things that I've been Confessing, declaring, the songs that we listen to, songs of faith, all these things can, were building me up so that when the attack came, there was, in Pastor Mary and myself, there was that, that uh, boldness and power of faith that was at work within us. And um, I have been confessing for quite some time that the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free of the law of sin and death. And I've been declaring it that way, way, way. I mean, uh, two, three years ago, I started doing that uh, on a daily basis. And um, that our youth is renewed daily. The Bible says our youth is renewed as the eagles. So I claim it every day. So my youth is renewed every day. And I declare that that's every cell, every tissue, every organ of my body is renewed daily. Jesus Christ redeemed me from the curse. The curse has no power over me. So I'm dead to the curse, it's dead to me. Uh, we receive all the blessings of Abraham, but none of the curse, because Jesus paid the price to take us away from the curse and restore us to the garden pattern. Now, if you don't know what that is, go back on some of my videos, you'll find the titles, the garden pattern, and you can learn more about that. But what I'm getting at is that we had spent years uh, from 1973 uh, to here we are, 2021, uh, building our faith, building our trust in God, increasing our hope, uh, meditating the Word of God, declaring the Word of God. And when the critical time came, and this isn't the only critical time we've had, it's, it's the only one physically that uh, death was involved, uh, but we've had other critical times, financial critical issues and, and so forth. But every time God has delivered us, and even when it looked like we were failing, the reality was that we were winning. And uh, so we're winners going somewhere to happen. Amen. So I just wanted to share that with that song, such an anointed song. Uh, that's uh, from Bethel up in Redding, California. And uh, you can find that on YouTube if you want to uh, use that as part of your daily worship routine. Anyway, like I said, it's good to have you with us. I know you could be somewhere else doing something else. But we're glad to have you with us. Torsha, also good to have you with us this morning. Praise the Lord. Um, I was encouraging people earlier to uh, take advantage of the season, get out and, and enjoy the sights, the sounds, the music, the atmosphere of the Christmas uh, season. Uh, enjoy it while it's here because, you know, it won't be just a few weeks and it'll be over and the world will move on to other things. So we want to enjoy this as much as we can. Uh, just a quick, a quick, a quick. You know what a quick is, don't you? That's a fast quick. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
we, uh, I just, last night, now I haven't checked it today, but on Saturday nights I check our viewership uh, between Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, YouTube, and uh, Gab, and those are the different social media platforms that we're currently on. Uh, we have, uh, as of last night, about 4,368 views. So we've now uh, gone over the 4,000 mark. We were, we were at it, just, just right at it before, and now we've gone over it. And I'm declaring that viewership is going to continue to increase. My first goal is to have 10,000 viewers uh, every week. And um, then uh, once we reach our first goal, then we'll set other goals uh, up to the hundred thousands and then eventually I believe in millions. So I'm, I'm a person that has big vision. Uh, I always see, you can ask my wife, I always see further ahead than where we're at. And she says, can't you just enjoy, enjoy where you're at right now? And I say, yeah, but you know, if you don't plan for the future, you don't have much of a future. And, uh, you know, you, you set your goals out there. And, uh, one, one, uh, gentleman said, uh, if you don't have goals, uh, and you're, you're moving through life, uh, how will you know when you've arrived, you know, when, when you've achieved, uh, when you've accomplished, I mean, you see things along the way, but if you have a specific goal to reach, uh, you reach that goal, you know, you've achieved that thing. And now you can set new goals. And we're getting ready to, in January, come January 1st, we will have a new set of goals for the next year. And uh, it's going to include things that are beyond where we're at right now. So uh, start praying about that. Start praying about uh, what, um, what you want to accomplish, what you feel God wants you to accomplish, uh, what's your vision for 2022. And begin to write down some goals. And I don't mean just these, you know, turn over a new leaf kind of thing, making resolutions that you don't keep. I'm talking about setting goals that you apply your faith to and begin to move forward. So praise God. Uh, I'm excited about the coming year. I know it's going to be a great year. And I know that a lot of the things the devil has tried to do are going to, we're going to see those things defeated. And we're going to see a, a comeback in this country. And uh, we're already seeing a comeback spiritually. We're seeing revival uh, taking place, not just here, but around the world. Uh, God is moving mightily. Uh, he's moving in the military. He's, he's moving in, in a lot of different areas that we might not expect him to move in. People that you might not think could ever be a Christian or be born again are getting born again and their lives are getting changed. So don't count anybody out. God's not done. We're not done. And uh, so we're looking forward to the next year. If the Lord comes, then if I could say it this way, all bets are off. <laughs> uh, we will have achieved our, our uh, supreme goal of uh, walking into eternal life and spending eternity with the Lord and our God, the Creator, our Father. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and start Instagram, and I want to greet them briefly. So while I'm doing that, I want to greet all of you that are on Facebook, whether you're on my channel or my, my Facebook page, uh, or you're on the church Facebook page. Uh, all of you that are joining us on Instagram, you're our Instagram gram family, so good to have you with us this morning. All of you on, um, what else is there, uh, Twitter. Uh, we have to do a different arrangement with Twitter uh, to get our program on there, but I've been posting it on there. So welcome to everybody on Twitter. And then uh, on YouTube, welcome to all of our followers on YouTube. By the way, whatever social media platform you are using to watch us, it, whatever the term they use, subscribe, like, follow, whatever the term is, do it, please. And uh, make yourself a regular uh, part of our ministry. Um, if you uh, want to become a partner with us, I'll tell you more about that near the end of the service. But we have partners. That's people that support us faithfully in their prayers with their faith and their finances. And uh, that's how this is supported. So if you want to become a partner and you're not already, uh, if by chance we run out of time and I don't get to it, which could happen, <laughs> um, send me an email and ask me, uh, Pastor, how do I become a partner? And I'll tell you how. All right. With that, we want to uh, get into the things that God's given us this morning. I want to 
uh, just declare to you the word God gave me uh, when I was in the hospital. And the, the, and the Lord spoke this to our son, William, and his wife, Jasmine, over in Australia. And uh, the, the uh, word was that I am a bionic man, of the bionic man, uh, uh, bigger, stronger, faster than before, completely rebuilt in the name of Jesus. Well, the night that I woke up, that I'm aware of, our son, Jonathan, who's our youngest son, was in the hospital room with us and he was talking to our oldest son will from australia and uh, uh i i came out of whatever you know i was under long enough to say tell will i'm the bionic man <laughs> which was the exact same phrase that god spoke to will and jasmine about and uh, william i think had to choke back some tears there knowing that god was moving miraculously but that was a supernatural word and so my part of my confession is every day that I'm back bigger, stronger, and faster than before, completely rebuilt in the name of Jesus. And I'm declaring I have not just not just a new heart, because then you could think, well, you can get a heart transplant. No, I have a recreated heart, totally recreated, made new, functioning in perfection in the way God intended it to function in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I'd like to take just a minute or two to read uh, Psalm 91. We've been doing this for almost two years now, and I really believe that you need to get this in you so it's um, you don't have to stop and read it. You, it. you can just quote it by heart because there's so many good statements of faith in here uh, that you need to have immediate access to. Psalm 91 from the Amplified Translation. We dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. We will say of the Lord, he is our refuge and our fortress, our God. On him we lean and rely, and in him we confidently trust. Therefore, he will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover us with his pinions under his wings, shall we trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler for us. We shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence of stalks and darkness, nor of the destruction and sudden death to surprise and lay waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it shall not come near us. Only spectators shall we be, ourselves inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High, as we witness the reward of the wicked. Because we have set our love upon him, I'm sorry, back up, because I, we have made the Lord our refuge, and the most high our dwelling place, there shall no evil befall us, and no plague, nor any plague or calamity come near our dwelling, and I say near our family as well. Hallelujah. For he will give his angels charge over us to accompany and defend and preserve us in all of our ways of obedience and service. They shall bear us up on their hands, lest we dash our foot against a stone. We shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, shall we trample underfoot. Because we have set our love upon him, therefore he will deliver us. He will set us on high because we know and understand his name and have a personal knowledge of his mercy, love, and kindness and trust and rely on him, knowing he will never forsake us. No, never. Hallelujah. We shall call upon him. He will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver and honor us. And with long life will he satisfy us and show us his salvation. Praise the Lord. You can't give much more complete, well-rounded declaration of faith than Psalm 91. So I encourage you to, to confess that every day until it's in you, and you can do it by memory. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. That's a um, special drink. <laughs> ACV, apple cider vinegar mixed with agave and water, of course, and uh, that's a good starter in the mornings. All right, let's get into this message this morning. Uh, I'm not, I normally don't preach holiday messages, so I'm not preaching one today. Of course, it's not Christmas yet, so who knows? By the time we get to Christmas, Holy Spirit may give me a Christmas message, but we'll see. I'm continuing with the series, uh, Principles of Biblical Prosperity. Just a quick statement. All of, all of those that may be listening who have heard or been told that the prosperity message is a false doctrine, a 
false message is coming from people who, and I'm not meaning to criticize anybody, but have not really spent time in the word reading the promises of God, the covenant promises that belong to us, uh, or they're willfully ignoring those scriptures, uh, or there's some that are just plain old jealous of the preachers that preach prosperity. But prosperity is not about how much we get, how much we have, what we possess. Uh, it's not about uh, jewelry and uh, expensive homes and expensive cars and expensive clothes. Prosperity is spirit, soul, and body. Because remember, when Adam fell, he lost, he died, spirit, soul, and body. And so poverty came as a result of the curse. Lack and want came as a result of the curse. But the, the spirit and soul part also were affected. And actually, first, uh, when Adam sinned, he died spiritually. He was separated from God. So there was spiritual death immediately. Well, the Word of God gives us the ability to go from spiritual death to spiritual life. And, and that's spiritual prosperity, fellowshipping with the Father, prayer, intercession, being able to communicate to God, calling upon Him for help, spiritual prosperity. The soul part of prosperity deals with our minds being renewed, our emotions being controlled, uh, our will being conformed to the will of God. And then we get into the physical part of of prosperity, and that deals with the flesh, it deals with material things, it deals with this natural life that we have here on the earth. If you look at the garden pattern, you find out there was no poverty, no lack, no want. In fact, there was abundant provision in every area. They had nothing to fear, nothing to be worried about. They could just sleep at night without any anxiety about animals or weather or anything else. And, uh, that we're redeemed from the curse, which means we're redeemed or declared back in the condition before the fall. So we have nothing to fear. Prosperity ought to become a natural thing in your life and not a not a um, uh, one-time thing or I hope I get there. Your mentality needs to change so you begin to think prosperously. And uh, when you begin to think prosperously and you begin to talk pros prosperously, then you'll begin to live prosperously because it's the thinking first, the word second, and the actions third, right? All right, so we're this is part 11 today on this Principles of Prosperity. I think we're going to wrap it up today. We'll see. Um, all of you on Instagram, if, if I'm still talking when our hour is up with you, uh, you can go over to Facebook and watch the rest of it, or you can watch it later. Uh, usually within 24 hours on our YouTube channel, Pastor William Emmons, and uh, catch up with anything you miss. So we've talked about biblical prosperity, but in, in a lot of circles, the moment you bring it into the material realm, they don't want to talk about it, as I've explained. But we need to talk about it. That's one third. When you, when you talk about redemption, spirit, soul, and body, there's three thirds, right? So spirit, soul, body. Why do we preach on the two-thirds, spirit and soul, and we ignore the third, third, <laughs> uh, the, the material realm? And so we've got to spend some time developing our faith and renewing our minds to what the Bible says about that. So we've talked about the other two areas of prosperity. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you might observe and do all that's written therein. Then, and I say this every time, you will make your way prosperous, you will deal wisely, and you will have good success. So what happens is, as we meditate the Word of God on what God has done for us in the material realm, what He's provided for us, that even with our tithe, the Bible says, prove me by this. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, pour out blessings upon you, that you won't have enough room to receive it all. Why limit that to the spiritual realm? That covers all three realms. Why not receive the soulish prosperity? Why not receive the material prosperity? And again, I'm not saying you got to have a million dollars in the bank or anything like that, but we can, we can live to a higher level than we've been living if we'll trust God for it. Amen. All right. Uh, by the way, the, the key to prosperity is right there in Joshua 1.8. Meditate, observe, which means to get revelation, 
and do, which means to act on it. So we meditate the word, we get the revelation of the word, then we act on the word. That will then put us in a position where we then, by the power of God and the wisdom of God, will make our own way prosperous and we'll deal wisely and we'll have good success. Hallelujah. Yesterday, not yesterday, day before yesterday, boy, time do go by by, by fast. Uh, Friday, I guess it was, we went over to our storage locker over at U-Haul. And when we moved, we didn't have everything uh, in order. We still got a garage full of stuff we haven't uh, taken out of, out of containers and put away. We don't want to unpack all the way because we're believing God to buy a house or to get a house. God can give us a house. Um, but we're living for our own house. We're renting right now. So we don't want to unpack everything. We're good. We've unpacked what we need. But we have a, a lot of things over in the U-Haul storage. So we went over there Friday to get some of the things. One of them was about a six foot tall, um, what would be co considered a toy soldier, but it's life size for our Christmas display. And the box it's in is, is huge. And I wanted to put it on top of the car because I didn't, I didn't think it would fit inside. And um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I've got two tie down straps, uh, which I thought would, would be enough. Come to find out there was no way to connect the two ends of the tie down straps together where they would hold. And, um, <laughs> and I'm looking at it and I'm walking around. I'm, I told Pastor Mary, I said, you know, what I thought would work all of a sudden I realized isn't going to work. And uh, so I'm praying and I'm thinking, well, I can tie the other end real tight. And, but, you know, you can hardly ever get it tight enough, you know, um, just with your natural effort to tie, a, uh, you know, tie it down. And so I'm, I'm going around, going around. And finally, I realized one tie down strap was long. And I said, Holy Spirit, I need you to show me what to do. And about that time is when I realized one tie down strap was longer than the other. And it was long enough I could go around over the top of the car, over the box, and pull it through the rear windows and crank that thing down with a ratchet to the point that thing was not going anywhere. So I did that with that one. I put the other one on with the hand tied. And then I had bungee cords that I put, I think I put six bungee cords diagonally across from one side up and over to the other in the rear, from front to rear, from back to front. The Holy Spirit showed me how to do that. We drove home and that thing did not budge. Um, and that's an example of prosperity in this natural realm. Now, that you may not think that's prosperity, but when, when you are successful in an endeavor and the wisdom came from God by the Holy Spirit, that's prosperity. So again, we're not just dealing with money. Money's not excluded. It's included, but that's not the whole. Amen. All right, Psalm, 9, uh, Psalm 35, verse 27, from the Amplified Translation. Let those who favor my righteous cause and have, uh, have pleasure in my uprightness shout for joy and be glad and say continually. What are we supposed to say continually? Let the Lord be magnified, who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. In order to say that it, prosperity is not a godly message, you're going to have to take your little religious eraser and erase that scripture out of your Bible because God takes pleasure in prospering his people. And that's you and I. Hallelujah. All right. I talked about where um, prosperity comes from. That James 1 verses 16 and 17 says, don't err, my beloved brethren, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from above cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Hallelujah. All right. The dividing line was John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the devil does. God doesn't do that. Jesus said, I came to give you life and that in abundance. So we need to realize abundance is not bad. Abundance is not evil. It's not sin. Yeah. But don't forget the scripture says uh, the, the root of, of all evil is the love of money, all right? If you love money more than you love God, then the root of evil is, is in you, all right? That's not what we're talking about, though. We're not talking about putting things before God. We're talking about putting God first and enjoying the things that he has made available to us. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, uh, so here's what we've got. Uh, there's 
Now, when I say a number like there's 12, those are the ones I've discovered up to this point. Now, I may discover more. There may be more. I don't know. But there are uh, 12 action principles, things you can do that will release prosperity into your life, godly prosperity into your material realm. All right. We've already talked about sowing and reaping, Galatians 6, 7. We've already talked about uh, every seed that reproduces after its own kind, Galatians 6, 8. In other words, if I give clothes, I can expect God to bless me with clothes. If I give a car, I can expect God to bless me with a car. Uh, if I give finances, I can expect God to increase my finances. Every seed goes back to the garden pattern. Every seed reproduces after its own kind. You don't plant one kind of seed and expect a different kind of harvest. Amen. Number um, three was uh, the act of faith in giving to God. And you can read Proverbs 3, verses 9 through 10. Malachi 3, verses 10 and 11. Uh, number four, giving to the poor. We talked about that. Proverbs 19, 17. Number five, giving to others. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. We were in in um, Cheesecake Factory. Most of you probably recognize that as a restaurant. We were there having lunch. Uh, was it Thursday? I think it was. Mm -hmm. And um, we're enjoying a good meal. There's one dish there that we've kind of fallen in love with. I don't know if that's the right term, but we 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 really enjoyed that one dish. And it's only 480 calories, and it's it's got everything that tastes really good. And when you're done, you're satisfied. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we ordered that. And we had a young man, I think he was from Texas by his accent, uh, just really waited on us and took care of us. And so I'm getting ready to pay the bill, and I just had this impression. I didn't hear a voice from God. I didn't see a vision. Just an impression. Tip him $20. Well, the bill was only... Um, about 40 and so I'd be tipping him 50% of the bill and uh, but I just I just had this slight impression tip him $20 and so I I looked at Mary and said uh, would you have a problem with me tipping him $20 she says no she she never she never has a problem with us giving people and blessing people uh, so I, I tipped him $20 and on the way out he stopped us and thank you so much I really appreciate that now, we don't know what he was going through. We don't know what he's facing. He may have little kids at home and maybe not making enough money to really bless them. I don't know. And maybe, you know, maybe that's not the only, we're not the only people that are doing that. Uh, obviously, we're not. But uh, we blessed him. And I believe that there was a specific need or desire in his life that that was able to meet, or at least part of it. So... That's part of this thing of giving to others. It's not just giving to the poor. God blesses that, and, and the Bible says God will repay. But God wants us to be generous. And that was the, the thing that the Holy Spirit brought up to me at that when I thought about that and the, the $20 tip. Um, the, the Lord reminded me that uh, I want you to be generous so I can be generous with you. And I thought, well, I want God to be generous with me. You see, it's not that we're bribing God, which is the world might think that, but that's not it. It's sowing seed. If I sow, the Bible says, if I sow generously, I'll reap generously. Yeah. So I want to be generous. I don't want to be stingy. And, and want to, so many Christians that, you know, have bad reputations in restaurants because they, they don't tip generously. Many of them don't even tip reasonably. Uh, you have a, you have a $50 bill on there and, uh, you know, you, you tip a couple dollars or five dollars or whatever it might be. Uh, and we've got a bad reputation uh, for tipping. And I want to be one that they want to, they like to see me coming. I want to be one that when we walk into a restaurant, they say, oh, there's that guy that really tips big, you know. So I'm, I'm, I am working at being more generous as we go and, and leading by the, being led by the Holy Spirit, of course. He'll show you what to do and how to get there. And you won't hurt. You won't suffer because of it. Because God is going to bless you. If you give generously, it'll come back generously. All right. Um, now, another actionable principle uh, that I've got at number six here 
is meditating the word of God. Joshua 1.8, uh, which I already quoted at the beginning, meditate my word day and night that you might observe and do all that's written there. And then you will deal wisely. You will prosper and you will have good success. But you've got to act on the word of God. If you don't act on the word of God, you've got to meditate before you can, before you can really act on it. There's too many people, they go out and try and do something. They haven't spent any time meditating the word and building their faith. So they go out and they act on a scripture they read, and it doesn't work. And I think in the early days of the faith teaching, there was a lot of that going on. Uh, a lot of people preaching faith and blessing and prosperity. And a lot of people uh, were not teaching that before you can walk in that, you've got to go to the area of meditating the word of God and getting revelation where it becomes a revelation to you. It goes off into your heart and you see it. Uh, when you meditate and observe or, or receive the revelation, then you act on that revelation. You don't act on just something somebody said. You act on the revelation of the word of God that you've received. And so we had a lot of people believing for 747s and, and you know, all kinds of stuff that obviously they didn't get. Uh, a lot of people got discouraged and they left the faith teaching. Well, you know, they said, well, we tried that. It didn't work. It's just a con game by preachers. No, it's not a con. This is a way of life. We've been living it now for, uh, oh, gee, 1973. So what is that, Mary? Uh, 83, 93, 2003, 2013. So that's 48. No, we're in our 49th year. Uh, so we've been living a long time. All right. So that's number six. Number seven is uh, being a doer of the word. Of course, we'll go back to Joshua 1, 8, uh, James chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, and James chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. We, we need to become doers of the word. So it's, it's meditate the word, get the revelation, do the word, act on it. Amen. All right, so let's go to number eight now, because we've already covered those seven uh, actionable um, uh, things, that principles. All right, so number eight, uh, applying faith to the situation. There's <clears throat> too many people that don't understand that you may have faith, but if you don't apply that faith to the situation, that mountain's not going to move. You've got to put the principles of faith into action. That's why you need to study faith. Um, so when you uh, you need to pay a bill, maybe you need a new car, maybe you need a better job, whatever it is, you can't just sit back and say, well, you know, I believe God will provide. Well, that's good if, if you've grown to that point where it's all you've got to do. But there has to come a point uh, in your uh, experience. Maybe that cord needs to be switched around. Okay, so we're having trouble with, uh, it's okay now? Okay, so we had a little bit of a glitch there with our Instagram feed. Um, so what we've got to do is, is begin to live out our faith uh, by applying faith as a force to the object we want to move. Jesus said, if you had faith, you'd say to this mountain, be thou removed, cast in yonder place, doubt not in your heart, believe the things you say shall come to pass. You will have whatsoever you say. So there's faith. You just study that, that verse right there and you get a great study in how to apply faith to situation. If you had faith, you would say. All right, so that there's that aspect of it. Uh, you don't quit. When, you, when you're standing in faith, uh, Paul said, after having done all, stand. So once you have put your faith out there on the object that you're trying to believe God for, uh, or you're trying to put your faith against a mountain that's in your way, so to speak, um, there's things that you do in the process. Um, you, you meditate that word. You, you spend the time getting that word, that scripture, or scriptures usually, into your heart and into your mind. And then you'll begin to get insight, you get revelation. It'll go off in your heart. But then you've got to have words that correspond to what you say you're believing. And you've got to have actions that correspond to what you say you're believing. So there's, there's things that you need to do in the faith process, and you can't give up. Paul said, after having done all, stand. I mean, you say, well, I, I tried that faith stuff, and it didn't work for me. Well, you didn't stand long enough. 
uh, well, I, I, I believe God for healing and I really prayed and I really believe God and I didn't get healed. There's no time limit. God didn't say stand until it feels like it's not working. He said, stand, having done all, stand. How long do you stand? Until you get the results. Well, what if I die? Well, you'll be with heaven. You've got all the results you'll ever need right there. Um, you know, well, uh, what if Jesus comes? Well, then you don't have to worry about it anymore, do you? We stand, if, if we stand in faith till our last breath is breathed, I believe the Bible, according to the Bible, God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. And we need, we need to remain full of faith. We need to be faithful to the word of God. Amen. Luke chapter 17, verse 5 and 6 from the Amplified Translation. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Have you ever asked God to give you more faith? A lot of people do that. Oh, God, give me faith. Give me strong faith. That's not how you get it. Here's what he says. The Lord answered, if you had faith, even as a grain of mustard seed, you could or would, most of the translations have it, you would say, to this mulberry tree, be plucked up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, I quoted a different scripture, if you would say that this mountain be removed. Uh, and he used both those illustrations. So don't get hung up on one or just the other and realize that it, as we quote these things, the principle applies to whatever it is that is your mountain whatever it is that's in your way, all right? Now, he said, uh, it would obey you. So there's two aspects of that as he wraps up that verse. Uh, one aspect is that the mountain or the mulberry tree or whatever it is that is your mountain would obey you. The other aspect of that is that faith, the Bible calls our servant, and that faith will obey you. And so if faith is my servant, and I put it to work, faith doesn't know anything other than to be obedient to our words and our corresponding actions. The Bible says um, faith cometh, right? Faith doesn't sit back and say, well, I don't know, you know, I don't know whether I want to do that or not. Faith cometh, how? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. In this case, the Greek word is rhema, by the spoken word of God. How does faith come? We speak the word of God. It brings faith into our hearts. When we give a faith command, we are declaring the word of God in that faith command. And the angels of God have to obey. The force of faith has to obey. Just like your electricity. If you don't ever flip a switch, the electricity doesn't do a thing. You have to flip a switch, which is the command for the power of electricity to flow. Amen. With faith, we use the power of faith and our switch is our words. We flip the switch by our confession, our declaration of faith, and faith has nothing, not, no other choice but to flow in your situation and bring about uh, the results that you desire. So faith will obey you. The thing that you're applying faith to must obey as well. Jesus spoke to water. Jesus spoke to fish. He spoke to the wind and the waves. He spoke to blind men. He spoke to lame men. He spoke to, spoke to a woman with an issue of blood. Uh, he spoke to dead and they were raised. Jesus was speaking words of faith. Say, well, he was a son of God. Of course he can do those things. Ah, ah, ah. Philippians chapter 2 says he stripped himself of deity. He did not come into the earth as God. And even though we call him the son of God, he is. But he stripped himself of his deity to be born as a man, to live as a man, to die as a man under the curse of the Old Testament so he could pay the price for us so we don't have to live under that curse. Hallelujah. He was our substitute. That's what Passover uh, is about. That's what uh, communion is about. It's remembering his broken body was broken so ours could be whole. He became poor that we could be prosperous and blessed. He, he went to hell so we don't have to go to hell. He suffered so we don't have to suffer. He bore our sicknesses, our diseases, our pain, our sorrow, our punishment, our poverty, our lack, our want. He, uh, depression, oppression, fear, anxiety. He bore all. Anything that's under the curse, he bore on himself as our substitute so we don't have to bear it. 
Watch out. I'm about ready to preach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's go to James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. King James translation says, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So he says, first, let him ask in faith. Second, with nothing wavering. Now, say, so how, how do I not have uh, doubtful thoughts? It's not the thought that, that gets you. It's the words and actions that get you. You speak out your doubt you, and you act on that doubt. You get whatever the doubt or the fear is as the result. You speak out your faith and act on your faith. You get the result of what faith promises. So you got to make sure you're speaking the right things and saying the right things, acting on the right things. Amen? All right. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now, I've been uh, a water person since I was a little kid. I grew up in Venice, California. The beach was a block from my house. And I spent my summers and even parts of the fall and winter um, and spring at the beach. Because in California, we don't have a real uh, fall, winter, spring, summer. We have summer a long time. And then moderate weather most of the time after that. And so I spent most of my younger years on the beach in Venice. Uh, I learned... Uh, how to survive waves. I learned, I was a junior lifeguard. Uh, I learned, uh, I made I made the first belly board I had ever seen. I made it myself. Uh, I, I did things that I'd never seen anybody else do. And it was just a thought. I wonder if this might work. And I found a piece of plywood and, and I, I start, tried to catch a wave with it. And I caught a wave just like they do with boogie boards today. Uh, and I, I started surfing waves that way. And and uh, I remember taking that same piece of plywood and I tossed it across that thin film of water that's on the sand as the wave recedes and it slid right across. And then what I thought was, I wonder if I can, if I can skim across there. And, and, and I'm not saying I'm the inventor of the skim board or the boogie board, but I never had, never had seen anybody do that before. And I, I was skim boarding, I was boogie boarding, uh, all with a piece of plywood. And now that's, those are big things, of course. Big, big money-making businesses are involved and everything. But uh, the, what I really am trying to get at is I grew up around the ocean. A lot of people are afraid of the ocean. They're afraid of the waves. I taught my grandkids. I took them down to the beach and taught them how to not be afraid of a wave, how to meet it head on, how to dive into the wave instead of letting the wave knock you down and, and run you over, you know. A lot of people aren't familiar with that and don't know how to handle the ocean. Uh, they'll get down there and a big old wave will come and knock them down and they think they're drowning and full of sand and, you know, everything else. But I told my grandkids, I said, come on, you go with me. I'll show you what to do that I want you to do it. Wave would come in and we'd run down and dive into the wave. It would crash behind us. We'd come up the other side. Now, that's not a big thing, except that we didn't have the problem with waves. and My grandkids weren't afraid of the ocean. And, uh, but one thing that I've noticed all those years of, of doing things, you know, on the water is that nothing is, uh, is, um, steady. Uh, it doesn't quit moving. It's always moving. That's why surfing is such a tremendous exercise because you're sitting, even when you're sitting on the board waiting for a wave, your, your core muscles are constantly firing because the water is constantly moving. It's never just flat. And it's constantly moving. So in order to keep your balance, your muscles are having to adjust and, and keep you in balance. When you're surfing, of course, all that comes into play. Uh, where we surfed most of our years was Malibu. And it's a cove and there's a current that comes in there. When the wind's blowing, it's even worse. And if you just sit there, you're going to end up under the pier. Uh, so we, we surf at Malibu first point, second point, third point. Um, but you've got to be sitting in the water waiting for a wave, kind of pad paddling gently to stay in, in your takeoff zone. And when the wave finally comes, you turn and you start paddling and you, you catch the wave. But it's, it's constant, uh, you know, movement, constant pressure. And uh, so when he says here, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. I understand that. 
Uh, growing up, my uncle had a 34-foot fishing boat. He used to take me out on that boat uh, on a regular basis. And I remember the waves. I remember crashing through waves. We took a trip from uh, Newport Beach up to uh, Malibu. Uh, actually, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the next place beyond that. We, it was a long trip for me. And we were bouncing over waves and crashing through waves and stuff, you know. And, and I learned really quick the ocean could be pretty rough. And uh, so I understand this phrase, when you are wavering, you're like the waves at sea, driven with the wind, tossed. The wind can create waves. And if you're out there in a boat and you have no way to control that boat, you don't have a motor on it or a sail or something, you're just at the mercy of those waves. Well, when you have doubt and you're uh, wavering, you're at the mercy of that fear and anxiety and doubt instead of letting it be at your mercy. So he goes on, he that wavers like a wave of the sea driven with wind and tossed. Let not that man, let not the double-minded man uh, think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. The double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If you've got, if you're a person of two minds, uh, you, you speak faith and then you have doubt and you, and you don't do certain things because of your fear, your anxiety, your doubt. All right. Uh, after, after my experience on, um, August 8th, uh, I came home and, and there were, you know, a few nights where I was dealing with this, this anxiety about going to sleep. You know, if, if I go to sleep, am I going to wake up? And I had to fight that. I had to come against it. I had to go back to the word that promised me just even what we read here in Psalm 91, uh, where it says, um, uh, let's see. Well, what's the word? It talks about um, the fear of um, the pestilence of stalks and darkness, nor the destruction that, uh, that uh, lays waste at noonday. Uh, that's just two phrases out of Psalm 91. I had to take the ver that those verses there, those statements with others, and I had to, one night I got up and I went in the living room and sat back in my chair and just tilted back and I couldn't get to sleep. I was battling in my mind uh, with that thought. What, what if I go to sleep and I don't wake up? There's nobody here to do what happened on August 8th and revive me. Um, and I had to battle that. And, and there was a battle for a while. But I wouldn't give up on the Word of God. And I wouldn't talk my fears I taught the Word of God. I didn't act on my fears. I acted on the Word of God. Well, even now, I, I asked the, the um, heart doctor, I said, um, is there any limitation on me? Is there anything that, that I should not be doing? Because I want to know what I need to apply my faith toward. And he said, no, actually, he said, you can, anything you feel up to, you can do. If you get tired, you know, sit down and take a rest. So I thought, well, bless God, I've got a new heart. I'm going to act like I've got a new heart. So, you know, when we went over to storage this past week and got stuff, I'm carrying the, these big containers you see at Costco, the black ones with the yellow lids, full of stuff. Sometimes we carry someone with books and stuff, and you know, that can be heavy. I'm picking them up, I'm moving them around, and uh, I, I thought, I am not going to live in fear. I am not going to live in fear of what if, what if, what if. So that's double-mindedness. I say I'm healed, and then I, I walk in fear, and I act in fear. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to live like what the word promises. Amen. I'm redeemed from the curse. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. He bore my infirmities, my sickness, my diseases. By his stripes, I was healed. Therefore, I am healed. Amen. I'm redeemed from the curse. Sickness, disease, and death are under the curse. I'm redeemed from that. <clears throat> I'm going to live life. Excuse me. Keep my throat wet. Mm -hmm. All right, so I hope you're getting the message here. You can't, <clears throat> you cannot, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> Woo, had an apple cider vinegar. Uh, you cannot be double-minded, which means you say one thing and do another. You've got to be single-minded. You've got to choose to believe what God says in his word. Now, that's, that's number eight, applying faith to the situation. All right. The next one, number nine, the actionable principle of faith. 
is speaking. And we've talked about these things, so these are not new in our conversation. I've been talking about speaking, confessing the Word of God uh, off and on this whole time. All right, so we must speak words of agreement. We must speak in, a, uh, in alignment with the Word of God. Now, when we read Joshua 1.8, God said to meditate his word day and night. Remember the word meditate there comes from a word that means to speak, to utter, to mutter, to declare. Even one of them is to yell, <laughs> to decree. If you read the in Strong's Concordance, the word uh, um, meditate, and look at it in the Old Testament, look at it in the New Testament, Greek and Hebrew, you'll find similar thing. The, the Strong Concordance uses a number of single word definitions. When you go through all those words and you look at the number of times it says to say something or to speak something or to mutter or utter versus thinking, it's three to one. Seventy-five percent of our effort ought to be our words. And only one percent is, is thinking, okay? The reason for that is the words are going to impact your thinking. What I'm, the Bible says, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which has the power to save your soul, mind, will, and emotions. The word save there means to renew. So receive with meekness the engrafted word, which has the power to renew your mind, to renew your will, to renew your emotions. So we receive the word through meditating, speaking, declaring it, not just through reading the Bible. Now, the Bible does say in one place, study to show yourself a proof, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a place for study. There's a place for reading. You ought to read your Bible. You ought to read verses every day. But the biggest impact, the thing that gives us the most uh, results is going from, medita uh, going from thinking about it, studying it, and reading it, to declaring it. Once we've read it, then we begin our declaration of faith. Once we know what God has to say about something, we begin to declare that as truth, as reality. So, we need to meditate God's Word. That doesn't mean you go around quoting Scripture. And I know, we all know religious people who think they're very spiritual because they can quote a lot of Scripture. And uh, we also know that many of those people are not very spiritual. They're very fleshly. Uh, it's not a matter of quoting Scripture. And it's not a matter of going around quoting Scripture, you know, to everybody you meet and stuff. We live by the Word of God, but our declaration of faith means that we speak in alignment with the Word of God. Not quoting Scripture necessarily, but making sure that our words line up with the Word of God. I know when people say, how are you doing? I'm blessed. I didn't get religious on them. I just said I'm blessed. Now, being here in Tulsa, that's common. We, we get that from people in the restaurants and stores. And, you know, you, you check out and from, uh, from one of the grocery stores or some other, you know, have a blessed day. You, you don't hardly ever hear that in California. I, I don't remember ever hearing it from a checkout person in California. But here, it's common. But that's an agreement with the Word of God. We are blessed. Uh, when we talk about our body, somebody says, how are you doing? I'm healed. I'm blessed. I'm doing great. That's not trying to look good in front of people. That's speaking in agreement with what God says. All right. So again, we have to align our words, our thoughts, our actions in, in alignment with the word of God. Now, that one we've talked a lot about, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. Number 10, and these are actionable principles of of uh, biblical prosperity. Number 10, corresponding actions, which I've already mentioned again. James chapter 2, verses 20 through 26. But wilt thou, O vain man, wilt thou know, sorry, I left out a word. Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So when, when, I, when I left my body back on August 8th, my body, as far as anybody could tell, was, was dead. Why? Because my spirit was in heaven. I, I was enjoying the beauty of, of this place we call heaven. 
seeing things so much better and greater than I'd ever seen before in this natural world. <clears throat> but my body was lying there lifeless. Well, when they revived me, I was brought back into my body. I left heaven and I was I woke up here on earth. All right. So as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works or corresponding actions is dead. You can say like uh, one one place that um, it says, uh, you say to me, um, I have faith. You say you've got works. I'll show you my faith by my works. We've got to express our faith, not being religious, but living out every step of faith, every action, an action of faith, that we walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we see, not by what we feel, not by what we hear, or what we, you know, not by the senses. We walk by faith, not by senses is more accurate, all right? So what, faith in what? Faith in God's word, faith in what the covenant has promised us. God's a covenant-keeping God. What he swore, he swore by himself because there was nothing greater to swear by. And that he would keep covenant with those that believe. So he's a, throughout the Bible, we see the phrase, covenant-keeping God. God is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps covenant with us who are believers. Amen. All right, let's move on to number 11, giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18 this is from the Passion Translation. And in the midst of everything, be always giving thanks. For this giving of thanks is God's perfect plan for you in Christ Jesus. He didn't say give thanks for the trial, the test, the tribulation. Uh, you know, the same Greek word is translated trials, tests, tribulations. And uh, what was the fourth thing, Mary? Temptations, tests, trials. Temptations, tests, trials, tribulations. All right. Same Greek word, translated four different ways. But he didn't say that we're to give thanks for the temptation, the test, the trial, the tribulation. He said we're to give thanks because that giving of thanks is a perfect will of God. In the midst of an attack, we thank God for deliverance. We thank God for healing. We thank God for provision. We thank God for whatever it is we might need. Remember the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace? They, they were praising God. Uh, Daniel and the lions, and he was praising God. They weren't thanking God for the lions. Daniel wasn't thanking God for the fire. They were thanking God for his delivering power. The common statement among them all was, you know, no matter what you do, King, you know, our God will deliver us. What are they saying? They're giving God glory. They're praising God. They're walking by faith. See, they're... they're Thoughts, their actions, their words all agreed with what God's promise was to covenant people. You and I are covenant people. God has made a covenant with us. He will keep his word if we will keep his word. See, it comes back on us. We're free moral agents. So the, the responsibility comes on us to take the step. God said, you draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. It comes to us first as responsible to come to God. When we come to God, then God responds. Amen. All right. So um, we, we don't praise God for the, pro the problems that we face. Back in the 70s, before we heard the, this teaching on faith and, and got set free, there was somebody, the past, a pastor that came out with a book that basically, I don't remember the exact title, but it was in essence, Praise God for Everything. And so he said, if you have a car accident, praise God for the car accident. If you get sick, praise God for the sickness. If you, if somebody dies, praise God, you know, for for their death. Uh, you know, well, we lost a child back then before we learned these principles, and I could not praise God for for that loss of that child. I couldn't praise God. We got so depressed. I mean, it, it was you know we were going to church out of religious responsibility at that point, not because we had anything that we felt we could praise God for. And so that teaching really hurt us. And I'm sure it hurt a lot of people because of it. What we finally got a hold of some accurate teaching from the word of God, we began to learn God was not our problem. God is not the author of our sickness, our disease, our poverty, our lack, our want, our death. People talk about the death angel. You know what a death angel is? It's the angel of God that comes to receive you when you lay down your life and breathe your last breath. 
It's not an evil thing from the devil trying to steal your life. Now, there is a spirit of death. I, I granted that. All right? But we are redeemed from that. That spirit has no power over us. So when you finally get a hold of the teaching of the Word of God, somebody is teaching it accurately and boldly and living it out. And we've been proving this now for 49 years. So we prove, we've proven it works. Hallelujah. So we praise God for the promises that promise deliverance from the attack, whatever the attack is. Remember, the Bible says that with every temptation, test, trial, or tribulation that comes our way, that God will make a way of escape. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says God is our problem, but that God will be the one that puts the temptation, test, trial, or tribulation on us. But it does say he'll make a way of escape. Jesus said it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy it's the devil that comes to put a temptation, a test, a trial, a tribulation on you. Jesus came to break that so you could be free from it. So our conversations, our words, our actions have to be in agreement with that. I can't be going to church and getting up during testimony time, say, I praise God for, I got, I got, I got the flu this week. And I praise God for the flu because it put me on my back and I had time to pray. Well, that wasn't God, but praise God you took time to pray. You know, obviously we need to take time to pray. But don't let the devil put you on your back or even in the grave, because once you're in the grave, it's a bit late. But we've got to remember, those testimony times can be good. I remember I grew up in Pentecost, and boy, we had testimony times. We had testimony services. So everybody got up and gave a testimony. We had worship, and then we gave testimonies. And I got five minutes for Instagram. All right, Instagram people, if you want to know how to support this ministry, uh, you want to become a partner with us, um, send me an email at wemmons one at gmail.com, and I'll send you the information. It's not complicated, uh, but I don't want to break up this teaching to give you that now, so you can get it or go back and watch it on, on uh, YouTube or on uh, Facebook. All right, so uh, John chapter 3, verse 33, John 3, 3, 3. Whoever receives his testimony has set his seal of approval to this. God is true. So when you receive the testimony from the disciples, the apostles, the word of God, you receive the testimony of a believer who's experienced an answer to prayer. You're setting your seal of approval on this, that God is true. That man has definitely certified and acknowledged. See, that man that receives the word of God, has acknowledged and declared once and for all, and is himself assured that it is divine truth that God cannot lie. God has not lied to us. With every temptation, test, trial, and tribulation that comes, he provides the way of escape, not the problem. Get that straight, John 10.10, 10, all right? Hebrews 6, 13 through 19. You know what? I thought I was going to finish this today. And now I'm not sure I'm going to. <laughs> we may have to go one more week. Um, let me read Hebrews 6.13 and then Deuteronomy 7.8. And I guess we're going to stop at that point. Uh, I hadn't planned on it that way. I thought we'd get through this today. But you know, what's one more week of prosperity, right? <laughs> All right. Hebrews 6.13 through 19. King James translation. For when God made promise to Abraham... Because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, saying, Surely, I in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end to all strife. In other words, when you when you take an oath, that ends the discussion. That means that from the time you take that oath, what you say is true. Okay? You go to court. You swear on a Bible. At least I think they still use a Bible. You swear on the Bible. Put your right hand on the Bible. And you swear an oath that what you are about to testify is true. And, and they accept that then, that your words after that, after that swearing in the Bible is truth. Well, of course, we know some people still lie. <laughs> But when we finally recognize that God, the creator of the universe, made an oath, a covenant promise, and swore by himself. 
because there was nothing and no one greater to swear by. All right. That he would keep his word. He would not back off his word. That we could trust him. All right. So uh, verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. Who are the heirs of promise? You and me. All right. We are the heirs of promise, joint heirs with Christ, heirs of God. Hallelujah. So willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, so that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. The Bible says Satan is the, is the father of liars. What would happen if God lied to us? He'd have to submit himself to Satan's authority. Do you think God's going to allow that to happen? No. He will not lie to you. He will not be dishonest with you. He will keep his word to you. It says, it, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, the hope, the hope of healing, the hope of provision, the hope of whatever it may be that your hope is out there working on. By the way, hope means, the definition of hope is confident and favorable expectation of good things to come. Goodbye, people on Instagram. We love you. Have a blessed week. We'll see you Tuesday night. All right, we just had to let our Instagram family go. Um, Instagram only gives us an hour I don't know why, uh, but that's the way it is. So we have to start it late and stop it early. Uh, all right. So we can have consolation and we be confidence. We can be comforted with the hope that we hold in the word of God, because God cannot lie. Hallelujah. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast and which endureth into that within the veil. In other words, it reaches all the way to the throne of God in the Holy of Holies. Our hope, our vision, our confident expectation of good things to come, which is what hope is. I expect this heart of mine to function till Jesus comes or until the time I decide to lay down this body. I expect it to be stronger than it was before. Because I have not only God's word, but then I got a specific word to me that I mentioned to you earlier, where God spoke and said that I'm the bionic man, like the bionic man, and I'm coming back bigger, stronger, faster, completely rebuilt. I'm declaring that. I'm not expecting to get a heart transplant. I'm expecting, and I believe it's done, that God has already recreated my heart and made it new. You see, I have hope. That's hope. Confident, favorable, favorable expectation of good things that would come my way, all right? I expect God to meet our needs. I expect our debts to get paid off. I expect to have a new home debt-free. I expect to have new vehicles debt-free. We're believing God right now for new vehicles. So, you know, I'm, I've got my faith out there applied for that. You know, praise God, the car we've got's been an excellent car. It's got about 165,000 miles on it, and it's still running like a top. But, you know, at some point, uh, it's nice to get something newer. It's 2006 model, so it's, uh, you know, it's aged a little bit. Um, I sold my truck before we moved, so I'm believing for a new truck. So we've got our faith out there on things in the material realm. That's not sin. That's not evil. That's not wrong. Um, they can be desires. They can be needs. It doesn't matter. Because the Bible says, if you delight yourself greatly in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So I have no problem believing God for a new truck or a new Corvette or a new motorcycle, whatever it may be. All right. Uh, that's not selfishness. That's not pride. That's not greed. Uh, it's just taking advantage of what God has provided for us. Everything the Bible says is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. The kingdom is not just spiritual. The kingdom man it has to manifest in our lives, in every aspect of our lives. Otherwise, we're not walking the full benefit of the kingdom. Hallelujah. All right. Deuteronomy 7, 9, from the King James Translation, Know therefore that the Lord thy God 
he is God, the faithful God, who keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments or his word to a thousand generations. Well, it has not been a thousand generations since Adam. So that means basically for humankind, that's the complete span of human history. See, because once we have the rapture of the church and then after the seven year tribulation period, Jesus comes back, that's the end of time and humanity's limit, a limited lease on this earth. We do have a thousand years of the reign of Jesus as king on the earth, and then we enter into eternity at that point. So time is limited. And, and when we think about our life and, and uh, you know, a thousand generations, well, uh, that covers the whole span of humanity in the earth. Doesn't mean man's going to be wiped out. It means that time, that man's position and time cease, and we now are in eternity living in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. All right. So for all that time, God is faithful. God it keeps covenant with us. See, once we're in eternity, we don't have to think about that anymore. The covenant applies to God's promises while we're here in this earth. All right. The heaven is part of the covenant, but once we've gotten there, that's fulfilled. So all the rest of the covenant deals with the natural world that we live in. And God has promised. And you find over and over again in the Bible, God blessing his people. God promising uh, through covenant to provide for Israel and, and, and bring it down to individuals. And we see uh, Solomon, the richest man in history. Uh, we see David, prosperous. We see uh, time after time, you look at names in the Bible now, you get in the New Testament and, you know, there, there are a lot of things that took place, but we see that the, the disciples had provision, you know, for their lives. Now, they may have died in different ways, but during their life and ministries, God provided for them. And that's what God promises, take care of us, provide for us. But we've got to believe him for it. All right. I want to give you an example here, the 10 lepers. Remember the story of the 10 lepers in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves to the priests. Didn't say a word about the leprosy. Didn't lay hands on them. Didn't spit on them, make mud and put in their eyes. Didn't do any of the things he'd done in the past. He spoke words of faith. What were the words of faith? He said, Go show yourself to the priest. By law, by Jewish law, they could not do that if they were lepers. They could not enter into the city. They couldn't be around other people. They couldn't go into the temple. So they were going to break Jewish law to be obedient to what Jesus said. Well, he said, go you show, show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went. Now listen to that statement. As they went. What were they doing? Acting on the word. As they went, they were cleansed. Now that means the leprosy stopped. It was gone. All right, no more leprosy doesn't say a word about being restored because leprosy eats away the skin. It just says they were healed, all right? Verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. So one gave thanks, all right? So it says in verse 16, he fell down on his face at his feet and gave him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, where then were there not there, I'm sorry, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? And there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. And listen, listen. Thy faith hath made thee whole. There's a difference between getting healed of leprosy and being made whole. Whole is restoration. 
healed is, the disease stops. See, there's some of you that need to go from healed to whole. You need to believe God for not just the healing, but for the miracle. You see, that means a miracle took place. The miracle of restored flesh. God can restore. I don't care what you were born with, what's happened in your life along the way. Not only will God is God willing to heal you and provide it for healing, but God has provided for you to be made whole. And I'm not trying to give false hope to anybody. I'm giving you biblical hope. Something you need to go after and believe God. If you're satisfied with just partial, you know, just getting healed but not being made whole, well, that's fine. You can go into eternity. Uh, and, um, you know, when you die, go to heaven, you know, and everything's good then because you'll be made whole then. But we can believe God for being made whole right now. If you had an accident and you got a blind eye, God wants to restore that eye. If, uh, you know, if you were sick and, and uh, you know, something happened and uh, they, they, could, they removed a part of your body, well, God can restore that body. When I say God can, you've got to take it by faith. You say, well, I tried praying and I tried and, and it didn't work. Well, after having done all, do what? Stand. Don't give up. We've seen testimony. We, we've seen with our own eyes miracles where God has restored missing body parts miraculously right before our eyes. I remember when Oral Roberts was preaching in the tents. As a kid, I saw it. I saw miracles take place right in front of my eyes. That's why I can never uh, not believe in miracles. And, uh, you know, when you, when you see them firsthand, and I'm not talking about things that could not be seen. I'm talking about things that were that happened right in front of our eyes. And, and we've seen the miracles. We've seen miracles in our lives, in our families, in our, in our church members. So I'm, I'm letting you know right now that you have that opportunity to receive wholeness. Spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Financially, be made whole in the name of Jesus. All right, so go back and study that uh, those verses there that I just read to you uh, about the lepers because that's a good example of faith. One man's faith, that he believed God. One of the things he did was he came back and uh, worshiped. He gave praise to God. In fact, that's the last thing that I want to present to you. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this up. I thought maybe I wasn't going to. So giving thanks with uh, actionable uh, principle of faith number 11 and then number 12. I think that's interesting. I found 12, uh, 12 disciples, 12 months of the year. 12 is an interesting uh, number for God. All right, so, oh, but let me go back to verse uh, Psalms 100, verse 4 and 5. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Now that's that. If you look at the temple, it is illustrating the temple experience for the Jews. You enter into the outer court. That's you come into the gates. But where's God? God's in the inner court. God's in the holy of holies. So you have access to a degree. He said, "Enter into his gates. Uh, enter into his courts with thanksgiving." Uh, I'm sorry. Let me reread that. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. The court is where God sits, where the king would sit on the throne, all right, with thanks, with praise. So you got thanksgiving and praise now in one verse. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name. That's praise. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth forever. So that leads into the tw number 12 here, giving praise. Matthew 21, 16. Uh, I'll just start at, at this point in verse 16. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. Psalm 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, this is what he was quoting, thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now we get it. Not only do we find strength the way Jesus quoted it, but we also find out of Psalm 8, verse 2, that as we praise God, we also are stopping the enemy and the avenger, the one that that, that, that spirit that says, I'm going to get you back. You know, you did this, I'm going to get you for that. All right, that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to get you for that. 
You make a mistake, you foul up. The devil says, I'm going to get you for that. You're going to pay for that. But the Bible says if we sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all righteousness, unrighteousness if we confess our sins. So if we mess up, and you know, we do, we're human, we, we make mistakes, we miss the mark. What do we do? We say, Father, I blew it. I, I, re I recognize what I did was wrong. It was sin. And you got you to gotta name it. It's sin. All right. I missed the mark. I sin. But Father, as I confess it, I, by faith, I receive forgiveness and I receive cleansing and restoration to right standing. Hallelujah. All right. So out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, I have to ordain strength because of thine enemies, so that thou mightest still the enemy and the Avengers. So we give thanks and then we make praise. Thanks and giving and praise are two different things. Father, I thank you for eating my body. And then I praise you because you are almighty God. I praise you for your greatness and mercy. And I praise you for my salvation, my healing, my redemption. See, one is specific thanks for a specific thing. And then we can praise to God for a specific thing, but praise God in general. We ought to be praising God every day. Hallelujah. All right. So there's 12 principles. Uh, let, me, let me read one more. Psalm 8, verse 2 from the New International Version. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Praise creates a stronghold against your enemy. The devil doesn't understand how you can praise God in the midst of what you're going through. But if you lift up a praise to God, not for the problem, but for the promise, then, then the devil, you confuse the devil. It's like, what are they doing? Don't they know they're in trouble? Don't they know that, you know, this or that? Or, and the devil wants to lie to you and shut that off. Get the word of God fixed in your mind. Begin to thank God and praise God for the promises. Hallelujah. I like what it says there. That through that praise, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. That praise raises up a banner, a praise shield against the enemy, the devil. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, so 12 things. Sowing and reaping. Every seed reduced after its own kind. Giving to God. Giving to the poor. Giving to others. Meditating the word of God. Doing the word of God. Applying faith specifically to your situation. Speaking words in agreement with the word of God. Corresponding actions. Corresponding and agreeing with your faith giving thanks and giving praise. Now, I'm not saying you need to go through the all 12 in every situation, but in, in every situation, different ones of these are going to apply, some of them to every situation, some to only specific situations, and many of them will work together. So uh, and it's not a matter, I, I've got to go around counting off these 12 in every situation, all right? If... <laughs> Because that's becoming legalistic, all right? Like, like the Word of God teaches us to be doers of the Word, live these 12 principles on a daily basis. Just live them out as part of your way of life, all right? And what will happen? You'll start seeing results. I know, because we've been living it out for 49 years, and we've been living in, in the results of God's blessings upon our lives and upon our family. And it's going to get greater and, and more abundant. And we're going to prosper spirit, soul, and body. And that's what God wants for you. Amen. All right. Father, I thank you right now for this word. This word of encouragement. This word of hope. This word of faith. That, that Father, we've spent all these weeks. Father, this was 11 sessions on this subject. Father, I believe that there was so much information here that people could be encouraged. That they could find hope and strength. And that they would not only find hope and strength, Father, that they would increase their faith and become doers of your word and begin to walk by faith and stand and expect and believe for miracles in their lives. We thank you, Father. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Now, I pray right now for healing. Father, I ask for you to move supernaturally in their bodies to heal. I'm, Father, because we talked about this, I'm asking you to do miracles, Father, restoration miracles, to heal and restore what the devil has stolen from people, whether it's physical, financial, social, family, marriage, whatever it might be.
Father, restore what the devil stolen. I ask for miracles, Father, in people's lives. In the name of Jesus. Oso ma brate, vende vista pala, vende visto, ulukoto, yebe shapala masa. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody right right up in this collarbone area, right right up in here. I don't know what's happened there, but uh, whatever that is has been bothering you. Something may have happened, may have been an accident, I don't know. I'm not getting the answer to that. What I'm getting is you've been having pain and problems with right up in this area of the collarbone. And I command healing upon that right now. I command that thing, whatever the problem is, I speak to the root of it. I command it to leave your body. And I command healing to come right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you that have been having problems with your back, and I'm not talking about the lower back section. I'm talking about the mid-back up through the shoulder area. Uh, that right now, I, I, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I command healing upon your back right now. In the name of Jesus, I command the aching, the pain, and to leave your body. I speak to the source of that pain. I command you to loose them and let them go. Let them go and heal in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Somebody with, with a shoulder problem. Now, this is not the collarbone I mentioned before. This is over here on the shoulder, the, the joint. I command that joint to heal in the name of Jesus. Lift your arm up, lift it up. In the name of Jesus, the pain goes, the stiffness goes. Hallelujah. Lift it up and give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're the healer. We praise you this morning. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're not born again, if you died today, would you go to heaven? The answer to that would be no if you're not born again. You say, well, you know, I go to church. I, I attend this church, that church, and I, I've been baptized. And But do you know in your heart that if you died today, you'd go to heaven? If you cannot answer that positively, you know, no, when I, when I die, I'm going to heaven. Then you need to get born again so that you know. And I want to lead you in a simple prayer. I want you to repeat this after me. Dear God in heaven, I make a choice today to believe the testimony of your word and of thousands of people how they have experienced the new birth, salvation. They got born again. I received that testimony that Father, Jesus paid the price for my sins. He had died and went to hell to pay my price and you raised him from the dead. And he is my risen Lord and Savior because today I make Jesus my Lord. Jesus, take control. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I surrender my life to you today. Now, Father, I declare you are my Father. You are my God. You are my covenant partner because I've made Jesus my Lord. And now I'm an heir of that covenant. And I thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you've watched any length of time, you know I've prayed that prayer in numerous ways. The point is, the Holy Spirit leads me in the praying for whatever the person is that is listening. If you prayed that prayer and you say, you know, as of today, I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. And what that means is if you made Jesus Lord, like we prayed according to the scripture, Romans 10, 10 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. That means you are going to heaven. You are a new creation. Sin has died in your life. It's gone in your new creation. Now, you say, well, what do I do now? I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, I've got a book for you right here, and it's called Welcome to the Family, and I want to send it to you free of charge. Uh, if you'll email me at wemmons01 at gmail.com, I'll send you that book free of charge, and uh, it will give you the basic things. That What do you do now? After you're born again, now what? Well, that book will give you the basic steps in getting started. Amen. All right. Hey, we love you guys. If you're a partner with us, once again, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your generosity. Our partners are what makes this programming possible. So we appreciate our partners, our partners very much. Uh, we have, you know, once in a while, people will give a single offering, and we appreciate everyone that has done that. 
if you want to uh, bless this ministry and so be supportive of what we're doing, and we are reaching, like I said, we had over 4,000, almost 4,400 views this week uh, from our two services, uh, and we're reaching people around the world. And if you want to be a part of that and help support that, uh, we ask you to pray about giving and uh, you know what God would have you do. If you want to become a monthly partner, of course, uh, pray about you know what that would be, what that would mean to you. If you don't have a church and God's been dealing with you about tithing, uh, we are an online church, obviously. I'm an online pastor now, at least for the time being. Uh, we have an online congregation, and you can sow uh, your tithe into this ministry, and it'll count just as real as if you were in a live attendance somewhere. Um, you know, some people don't have access to this. So we want to let you know how you can do that. If you have PayPal, uh, you can go to PayPal, type in our email, which is W-E-M-M-O-N-S-01 at gmail.com. And once you type that in, it'll take you to our page. Uh, you'll fill in the amount that you want to give. Uh, go to the next page and you have an option of choosing friends and family. Make sure you do that. Otherwise, they take out about 3.8% of whatever you give. We don't want to lose that money. Uh, and then follow through the directions to uh, you know doing that. If you have a Venmo account, it's an app you put on your uh, smart devices. Uh, you can type in the at symbol. You know what that looks like. A with a little, almost a circle around it. At William dash Emmons dash 10. Make sure you capitalize the first letter of my first name, the first letter of my second name. Uh, at William Dash Emmons Dash Ten, that goes directly into our Venmo account, which transfers directly into our ministry account. Uh, if you want to give by debit or credit card, you can email us or text us your debit or credit card information with the uh, the full number, the three code digit, three digit code. I'm sorry, you have to include the zip code where your your billing goes or your statement goes for that. And of course, your name and the amount. Uh, once you've done that, we'll run it. And once we've run it and it goes through, we will delete that from our device so that nobody can get their hands on it. Um, so that's a debit or credit card. If you want to give by check or money order uh, through the mail, you can do that. Our, our mailing address is Post Office Box 141074, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Zip code is 74014. We have a number of people that support this ministry faithfully, and they give through, most of them give by check or money order, but some use those other uh, options as well. The point is, if you want to support this ministry, there's many ways you can do it, and we appreciate everybody that sows seed in this ministry. Our confession for you is that because you have given, it will be given back to you according to the Word of God. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. God will cause men to give unto your bosom. Well, the Bible talks about some reaped 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. So we declare that all of our partners receive no less than a 100-fold return on their giving in the name of Jesus. We love you guys. We appreciate you. We will see you Tuesday night uh, for our Tuesday night live Bible study. West Coast time, 7 o'clock Central time. Uh, 9 o'clock, and then East Coast time, 10 o'clock, and after that, depending on where you're at, you'll have to figure it out. Uh, and then next Sunday morning, we'll be back here again. That's it. We love you guys. Have a blessed week. Enjoy the season. Give God thanksgiving and praise and glory. Amen.